Oh, this get up? Oh, this get up. Well, I'm a reporter. Really? I'm a reporter for the New York Tribune, which doesn't exist anymore, okay? okay. Put it in perspective, it doesn't exist, so okay. I'm a period reporter. Okay. New York Tribune, hi! That's the man I was talking about. Uh, what year is this? What year are you? When I woke up this morning, I looked at my watch, and it said 1862. So, in 1862, Harper's Ferry burned. Right? Stonewall Jackson, he had cannons up there, he had cannons up there, and he bombarded the place. Right? September? You don't remember that? I was a young child. Yeah, well, the place burned, but it's back, see? It's got federal funding now, and it's like looking very pristine. Yeah. Right. Well, where were we? 62. What else happened? You're a reporter. So you're reporting on the news? Who prints your news? Well, it's Horace Greeley. You ever heard of him? Yeah, sure. Go West, young man. Go West, young man. That's exactly what he supposedly said. <laughs> but he had, the, he had the biggest paper in the country for two reasons. You know, he had a daily, the New York Tribune, he had a daily that went up and down the East Coast. But he was the only one of the big daily papers that had a week, and the weekly covered the entire United States. So in 1859, when he traveled the country, they all knew him. He got to Colorado and they named a town after him. Why? Because they felt like they already knew the guy because they read his news every, every week. And that's the only news they get from a national perspective. That's like USA Today. You know, it doesn't come from Florida, it doesn't come from New York. It's a national newspaper, and that's what he kind of was the first one to actually do, is to make a national <laughs> newspaper. Well, and what's a typical day? Or typical day? I'll tell you, um, I don't portray an actual person. I'm a freelancer. I freelance for the, uh, the Tribune, but also other smaller newspapers, you know. And um, that way you earn three, four, five different paychecks. You know, you can write the same article and then ship it around the country, practically, you know. So it's, it's a smart way to go as a freelance. You know, if you're from a certain town, like if I'm from Baltimore, I could, do, I could work for a Baltimore paper, but I could also travel up to New York and get, get employment with the uh, Tribune, especially since the war's on, you know, because they want a lot of war names. So, yeah, that, that's the smart way to go with that. That's what happened to Dana, you know, Charles Dana, who was the managing editor of the uh, New York Tribune. He was actually the first managing editor of any major newspaper ever. But he was, um, that makes him the number two man in the company. And what he did, he went, <clears throat> he went over to Europe and he started sending dispatches back, which the Tribune published. You know, he was, he actually, uh, interviewed Karl Marx, so the Tribune was actually printing things by Karl Marx. Hmm. And Greeley didn't give him much money. So what he, ha what he did, he was actually sending dispatches to other newspapers in the United States, unbeknownst to Horace Greeley. And when Dana came back, he had more money than when he left. You know, which is kind of funny, he should have been broke. <laughs> he should have been broke when he got back, but he had more money than when he left because he was sending all these dispatches all over the country and they were printing them, you know. So he wasn't stupid. But yeah, um, I'm dressed typically for the period. This is a duster. That means I'm traveling. That's all this is, means is I'm traveling. Keeps the dust off my clothes, you know. I got high boots because I'm riding on a horse, mm -hmm. you know. These are cotton pants. I'm not wearing wool, you know. Soldiers wear wool. I don't have to wear wool. I'm a civilian, so I got wool, wool vest. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a wool vest, but it's cotton trousers, cotton shirt. <laughs> it's a little bit cool. Telegraph, but they're not getting news over the Telegraph. This weekly newspaper that Horace Greeley sent over to the other states allowed these people that left home because they used to live on the East Coast, and then they moved to the West Coast, and now all of a sudden they don't know what's happening back where their family lives. See, so this paper at least is bringing news all the way 3,000 miles across the United States. Now these people on the West Coast 
can at least know what's happening on the East Coast, which is the seat of government and, you know, all that good stuff. Finance, everything else is happening on the East Coast. So at least they're getting some news. So that's, that's mainly it. You know, he was the only one to do that. And like I said, when he traveled to the United States, they were very glad to see him because they were grateful for the fact that he was sending them a newspaper once a week from New York City, the New York Tribune. Now I'm getting a big piece of paper. Right, right. Well, they, the newspapers were very small back then. It's only one big sheet that you fold in half. That's all it was. Advertisements on one page, news on the other, fold it in half. You got four sides. That's the newspaper. It was only costing two cents. One, two, three cents. It was very cheap. But you know who Charles Dickens is? The guy who wrote David Copperfield and Christmas Carol. Remember the Christmas Carol? Did you ever see that? Like Charles Dickens? Scrooge? Charles Dickens. In 1840, he's from England. Charles Dickens from England, right? In 1840, he came over the Atlantic Ocean to visit America. And he didn't like the Americans. He thought they were a bunch of pompous morons. He hated the Americans. But guess what? He did say, he did say, everywhere I go in America, they got their heads stuck in a newspaper. <laughs> they might be dumbbells, but guess what? They are reading newspapers. They're very literate. What that means is, well, the word is literacy. Literacy means you can read. If I'm literate, that means I can read. Okay, and the literacy rate in the United States was the highest in the world right then, which is hard to believe. In 1840, we're a bunch of pumpkins, but everybody in the country could read. You couldn't go over to Europe and say that. Yeah. Well, you're working on it. <laughs> you're going to school. You're working on it. See, that's that's the whole idea: is get everybody literate. They can read, form their own opinions, and then they can write newspaper columns. <laughs> You know, that's what this government's made of, people arguing with one another. I think this way is right. No, I think this way is right. And they argue back and forth, and you try to figure out what's the best way to do it. Yeah. Like one day, like, like, I don't, um, like, I was watching TV, and I went on the news that this bridge collapsed. Right. And then the day after, no one talked about it. There was nothing about it. And then yeah. they went, went to the next subject. So it was like, one day, you're collapsing. The next day, something gets robbed. Done. Done. Well, you, you just brought up another point. You just brought up another point because in New York City, there was at least three big newspapers. And they were all fighting to get the news on the street first. If, your news, if the news is on the street first, you sell newspapers. If all three come in at the same time, well, you sell some. But if you have the news and the other two don't have the news, you're the one selling the newspaper, see? Like the Battle of Gettysburg. The New York Tribune was the first big paper to have news about the Battle of Gettysburg on the streets of New York. You know, the newspapers were being sold. This Battle of Gettysburg, Battle of Gettysburg, none of the other papers could say that because they didn't have any news yet. They were actually allowed to copy, copy off the other one if they wanted to, but still, that's hours and hours that the New York Tribune was selling news about Gettysburg where the other newspapers didn't have anything about Gettysburg yet. So he was selling, he was making money and they weren't. His newspapers were selling, the other guys weren't because he had it on there. But here's what happens. The New York Herald is like the arch enemy here. The New York Herald is kind of a mean guy, nobody likes him. He tells his reporters, see the way you, the way you send your, your, your uh, your story to New York, you might be 500 miles away from New York, but you go to somebody who operates a telegraph, before they had telephones, they used telegraph, right? You go to a telegraph office, uh, office and you call them telegraphers. We're called telegraphers. And here's what the Tribune would say. The Tribune, if he's the first guy in line, he'd say, here's my story, send it to New York. And when you're done with that, here's the Bible, Here's the Bible, start sending that. Start sending, start sending the Bible. What that does, it stops the other guys in line from using the telegraph. Now it costs five cents a word. Every word that he sends from the Bible is five cents a word. Now five cents is a lot more back then than it is now, right? 
five cents a word they're sending the Bible and holding up these other papers from getting their dispatch to New York City. So that's hours, hours that the newspapers are being sold on the street and the other papers don't have the news yet. See? That's the trick. Now you followed that because I kept it simple, right? You followed what I'm saying about the telegraph, right? Where the telegraphs? She doesn't know. She wants to know. What's the telegraph? telegraph? What's a telegraph? Okay, good question. A telegraph works like your, like your computer does. Everything in your computer, I mean, it looks like words on the screen and pictures on the screen, but everything it deals with, it's either assembly language is what they call it. It's either, it's either on or off. It's either a zero or a one, zero or one. It's long strings of numbers, but it's either zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one. It's just strings and strings of either zero and one. And that's kind of like a telegraph. You got dashes and dots. You got long dashes and you got short dots. So it goes, the guy has to hit a little key with his finger. And he's sending a code. The guy at the other end knows the code. And when he hears that, he knows what words are. He's writing down the words that you're spelling out from the other end. He don't hear words, but he hears, and he knows the code so well that he is writing out the words at the other end. Like what happened here at Harper's Ferry. When John Brown took over Harper's Ferry, he tried to start a revolution, he's setting slaves free. The new, he allowed the, 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 the railroad to come in. He stopped them, he allowed them to come in. Uh, and then after a few hours, he let the railroad go. That wasn't too bright, he let the railroad go. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, the first time they got to a railroad station, they went into the telegrapher's office and said, quick, send this to, send this to Washington, send this to Baltimore. And it's lightning fast. They call it the lightning, as a matter of fact, the lightning, because it's electricity, it is lightning, you know. And they call it telegraphy, lightning. And it sent those messages instantly to the other end. All they had to do was write it down as it came in. And they found out John Brown has taken over Harper's Ferry and he's starting a revolution, da 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 send troops, la da 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 and that was the message, and that's the troops immediately got sent out here to stop him from doing what he was doing.